from Columbia in high definition. This is WIS News 10 Awareness. Thank you for joining us for Awareness. I'm your host, Megan Norman. It is not always what you think. Homeless teens hiding under bridges or living in parks. There is a population of youth who are learning the skills it takes to make it on their own someday. We recently talked with Aaron Hall from the Midlands only shelter for teens, Palmetto Place Children's Shelter. Also, Abby Cobb, a social worker who works with the Richland 2 School District. When people hear the word homeless, there is an image that comes to mind. But youth homelessness might look a little different. What is that image? This is true. I think traditionally people think of kids living in their cars. Um, and the image to us really is kids who don't have a place to live. They may be couch hopping, sleeping in a different place every night. Um, just truly not a place to call a permanent home. Now, Abby, what do you see working in the school district? Is it easy to identify these, these youth who don't really have a stable home? Really, many times it is not very easy. Um, what helps is when we have a, a teacher or a staff person who really has a connection with our students at the school and, and they can, um, you know, and having conversations with students that might come about that they are couch surfing or they're living with friends or they're bouncing around to different homes. Um, many times it can be a really big challenge and we just kind of have to have our eyes and our ears open just to, to see those red flags and to try to pay attention to those indicators. Is it a prevalent problem within the school district? It, it really is, unfortunately. Um, we have seen that our numbers have grown, and uh, I think it's a twofold situation where while the need is increasing, I think we're doing a much better ide of identifying our students mm -hmm. who, who have the need. And so that is wonderful for us because we're able to provide services and get our hands on those students who need the assistance. But absolutely, the, the prevalence is increasing. Now, Erin, what are some of the circumstances that lead to youth homelessness? There is a wide variety. I know in one case we have a student whose mom was homeless and they were living in a church. And when her mom was able to find a job, it was out of state. And the student knew that if she went with her mom, she was going to lose her support system here in Columbia. And she was also going to lose her in-state status mm -hmm. that she had worked really hard to get at the college she was going to be going to. Um, so that's one case. We have cases where parents kick their kids out. And we don't always know the reasons, but typically the kids who come to live with us um, are really great kids. So we just sort of move on from that and think positively and help them get back on their way. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Palmetto, Child Palmetto Place Children's Shelter. You host 20 children. Right. So the majority of the kids at Palmetto Place come through Department of Social Services and they come from homes where they've been abused or neglected. But then we also have this special program funded by United Way for homeless teenagers or unaccompanied teenagers. Um, and we really work with all our teenagers on independent living skills and getting into college or the military or finding a job, whatever's the right path for them after high school. Now, the teens usually will stay for a longer period of time than some of the other kids, correct? Exactly. So with our teen program, usually they're going to come to us in their junior or senior year and finish with us through high school. Okay. Now, with some of the children who come through DSS, for example, they're there for a couple of months, mm -hmm. and then they have to transition back to their home life. What does that process or transition like? I think it's very stressful and it's very challenging. We don't always know until the day they're going home that they're going home. So it's really hard to be able to help that child understand what's going to happen and help them transition. And I think if I were one of those parents in that situation, it would also be, be very stressful that um, you've got kids coming back home and they're your kids, but you've been separated from them. Um, that's a lot of change overnight. And now, have you found in the, the years that you've been the executive director that when the children return to that home life, it's for the better? It's case by case. We have a lot of kids who come back to Palmetto Place after having gone home. Um, that is always heartbreaking to me, to see kids go back into a situation that isn't great and then come back into foster care and be at Palmetto Place. Now, Abby, family homelessness and youth homelessness, there are some similarities there, but also some, some differences. There are, there are. Um, I think one of the commonalities is that poverty, I think, plays a big part in, in both factors. Um, 
I think that families are facing with all types of different stressors and there's all types of barriers that they're having to face and um, many of that leads to family homelessness when families can't afford to pay their rent or there's some type of disaster or um, crisis situation that really just kind of pushes them to the edge and, and being able to maintain housing can be a really difficult thing while trying to take care of your family at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think one of those commonalities is that when you have that stressor being added year after year after year, um, that can impact how a family functions. Mm -hmm. um, many times can impact parenting. Um, and I think that sometimes that that could lead to, to our youth homelessness is that um, after years of stressors and years of barriers of facing as a, as a parent and trying to deal with that, eventually just adding on teenagehood and, and the decisions and the struggles of raising a teenager can can increase or can impact their ability to uh, make wise choices and sometimes that could lead to youth homelessness as well. Do you find that that lifestyle has a negative impact on the child? Like does the cycle continue with the child? Um, there are absolutely some negative impacts. I think it, that there's no if and ors about mm -hmm. that, that dealing with poverty um, is a struggle that, that does have negative influences. By all means, there's, there's, there's always a way out. There, there is a way out. Um, and generational poverty exists and, and it will continue to exist. Are there any other resources out there that the school district provides or, or leads families or, or kids to in their times of need? Absolutely. There, there are, we are very fortunate living in Richland County mm -hmm. in uh, the capital of the state where we have a lot of resources where we can try to help families get assistance with whatever their need may be. Maybe it's rental assistance or trying to, to help provide services for prevention, for homeless prevention. Unfortunately, the demand far outreaches the, 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 the ability or the resources that are available in the community. Right. Um, Richland, too, is extremely fortunate. We have a good number of social workers who work really hard with our families to try to get them connected with our resources. Unfortunately, there's just not enough to meet the demand. Right. Well, Palmetto Play is just one of those resources, but again, there are 20 beds. So that right. clearly does not meet the need. Absolutely. And we turn down kids on a weekly basis, and that's one of the hardest parts of our job. Now, tell me a little bit more about the day-to-day -day life at Palmetto Place. So I think the general perception of a children's shelter is a very sad, gray place. Um, we have a really happy home, and I think one of my favorite parts of the day is in the afternoon. I can hear when the kids get home because I can hear the basketball on the basketball court. Um, and we are fortunate to have great volunteers and great staff who do art projects with the kids and play basketball with them in the afternoon. and. There are healthy snacks and we have a great cook and on the weekends these kids are busier than a lot of other teenagers <laughs> and kids of other ages just because we are able to do a lot of different activities. Um, so we keep them going and we keep them happy. And do you feel like the kids are very receptive to their new environment because it is a, a very different change for them? It's a huge change. I would say it takes about 48 hours to kind of settle in when a kid arrives. It's really difficult to walk into a house um, with staff that are going to be sort of, there's, there's a staff person who's like a grandma, there's one who's an aunt, there's one who's like a big sister. Everybody plays a different role. But to walk into that is, it's a lot. It's very overwhelming. But you can see everybody sort of calms down once they realize <laughs> they're going to have a home-cooked meal clean sheets on their bed, clean clothes the next morning, they can go to school and think about school right. and not think about their next meal. Would you say you have a success story out of Palmetto Place mm -hmm. or several success stories coming out of there? I would say our success story is that at the end of the last school year, we have three kids who graduated from high school and two of them went on to college. Mm -hmm. That to me is a huge success story. I think another one is we have a beautiful young lady who graduated from high school several years ago, um, then graduated from Midlands Tech and will be going on to USC soon. Um, she comes back to visit. She comes back to be a mentor to our kids who are there now. And that is a huge success to me. Well, that is great. Now, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about is the relationship between the family, the mother, the parents, and the child while they're at Palmetto Place. 
do they keep in contact? It really depends on the situation. So with Department of Social Services, sometimes there are reasons that the child cannot have contact with their family, and that's really hard. Um, but for the kids who can have contact, there are visits with the family and their phone calls, and we do our best to make sure that mom or the parents or whoever's the guardian um, knows when we had a really good day at school or got to do something new. Right. Um, and with our teenagers who are homeless or unaccompanied, it's very different. Those kids are really used to being on their own, and so I don't think there is the same level of family interaction. Well, Aaron and Abby, thank you so much for being with us this morning, and thank you for all the work you do in the community with these, these children. Thank, thank you. you. Still to come on awareness. It's not like, oh, I'm going to go to school, like, I'm angry, sad, because I don't have anything to eat on my lights off. I just go to school like nothing happened. For one brave teenager, homelessness is his reality, but not his label. How he finds the strength to press forward in the face of adversity. Welcome back to Awareness. It was a tough decision for one teenager and his mother. When faced with financial troubles, they had to go their separate ways. But this young man does not let homelessness get him down. He's pressing forward until he can learn to make it on his own. Hard work, struggle, power. 17-year-old Kendall Benjamin spends many afternoons in the weight room at C.A. Johnson High School. The graduating senior plays football, track, and wants to study athletic training in college. He comes to school every day, and many around him don't know what it's like when he goes home at night. If you ask me, I'll tell you, but it's not like, oh, I'm going to go to school, like, I'm angry, sad, because I don't have anything to eat on my lights off. I just go to school like nothing happened. It's like a normal person. I just don't like feeling sorry for myself. Kendall lives at Palmetto Place Children's Shelter. It's not home, but it's something to help me get on my feet. He has 19 roommates. We take kids from newborn to age 18, and they come from homes where there's been abuse or neglect. And then we also have teenagers who have no other place to live. Not every child at the shelter comes from an abusive home. Kendall's mother lost her job, and with it, the ability to provide for her children. It is incredibly diff difficult for a child to leave home. Kendall says he finally had a heart to heart with his mother. We gotta stop hiding and just do something about it. We can't just stay here and be like, 
we making like everything's all right when it's not all right. So I need to go take care of me so you can take care of you. And hopefully when I take care of myself, I can, you know, help you out later in life. Kendall does not want your pity. He keeps pushing himself every single day. Sometimes you have to make a way when there's no way. For youth who find themselves in desperate situations, there are resources out there to help. Sharon Walker sees these situations every day. She works with court-appointed special advocates for Richland County. Thank you so much, Sharon, for being with us this morning. Thank you for having me. Now, what circumstances get you involved? Whenever there are allegations of abuse and neglect of a child, um, that could be educational neglect, it could be physical abuse, it could be sexual abuse, you know, it could be physical neglect. A parent is possibly using drugs, um, not supervising the mm -hmm. child appropriately. And now sometimes rights are terminated. That's correct, yes. Unfortunately, but mm -hmm. sometimes families are reunited. But what happens in that time period when the family, when the family is separated? Mm -hmm. What our uh, volunteers do, we're um, appointed by the family court in Richland County, and we appoint volunteers who go out and conduct their own investigation. They'll be talking to the child to find out what happened to him or her, um, what circumstances they found themselves in. We'll talk to the parents. We'll also talk to someone from the Department of Social Services because they're conducting their own investigation as well. But what we want to do is make sure that we share the information that we receive, um, gather information, and try to make recommendations to either return that child back to the home or determine really what's in the best interest of this child. Now, if the child does return, there has to be, I would assume, some kind of counseling or some kind of therapy that happens in the interim to make sure the child is ready to go back into the home. That's correct. There's a treatment plan that DSS um, performs or proposes for the family to do. It addresses whatever issue brought the child in. If it's physical abuse, maybe there's some anger problems at the home that the parent tends to take out their frustration on the child. So we may ask the parent to do anger management in order to learn how to appropriately address their anger in another manner. Um, it could be counseling if a parent has a mental health condition. If a child has a mental health condition, mm -hmm. then we want both of them to have counseling. What we also do is visitation. Um, depending on the age of the child, we may do transitional visits and you know, also in addition to how long the child has been out of the home to make sure that we just don't plop them back into a situation that's going to be dangerous for both him or her and the parent. So maybe it starts with one hour visits or yes. maybe overnight and That's correct so and it's as the uh, situation dictates. And how do you know the treatment works? You don't know. Um, what you can do is you ask that parent to go through and do everything that you think they need in order to address, but you never know if it has actually worked. And it's one of those situations where you, you just have to put faith in the parent. And then we also follow up. We don't just return that child back to the home. We're still going out there. We're monitoring the situation. We actually expect a flare up if a child is returned to the home. We think that's normal. And, and we tell parents, look, if that child acts up, if that child says, well, you're not my parent or that's not where my right. placement um, said that I had to do, that's okay. We, we expect that. We want to hear that. So don't be afraid to tell us that. All right. Sharon Walker, thank you so much. Thank you. When awareness returns, some things should not be put off, like going to the doctor. Coming up, we'll hear from health advocates about the importance of preventative care.
In the African American community, health is not always the first priority, and some diseases can be prevented with proactive measures. Here with more, Dr. Frank Berger with USC's Center for Colon Cancer Research and Mary Higginbotham of the National Kidney Foundation. Thank you both for joining us this morning. Thank you Thank for you. having us. Now, when some people hear the word colonoscopy, they get scared, they get nervous. But why is it so important to have that screening process done? Well, colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in South Carolina as well as in the nation. And like many cancers, it occurs early in uh, non-cancerous forms, which when, if they're detected and removed in those forms, they will not progress to a full-bledged cancer. So we're promoting, the, we're promoting screening, encouraging people to get screened at the appropriate age in order to prevent colon cancer from ever occurring. And what age is that? We recommend if there are no risk factors, like uh, a parent who's had colon cancer, we recommend uh, screening should start at age 50. Uh, for African Americans, we recommend at 45 because they do have higher rates and they do uh, present with colon cancer or diagnosed with colon cancer at slightly earlier ages. And what is this process like in terms of screening? Is it very painful? Give us an idea. It's not painful at all. People who go through it will tell you it's no big deal. It was much easier than I thought. The biggest constraint people have is the preparation because the colon has to be cleared the day before and the night before so that the colonoscope can get in and do its job and that turns off a lot of people. Right. So that's really the the most uncomfortable part of it and it's really not that uncomfortable. But the key is getting that done because it can be prevented. Absolutely. Colon cancer is at least 60 percent 60 percent preventable and probably 90 to 95 percent if uh, everybody who was at risk would go through the process. All right, thank you, Dr. Berger. Now, Mary, when it comes to kidney disease, African Americans tend to have kidney disease. Mm, Many of them right. do. So what are some yes. of the risk factors? Uh, diabetes and high blood pressure are our, the main leading risk factors. Of course, if you have a family history of either of those or of kidney disease in your family, you should consider yourself at risk and increase risk for kidney disease. And as you mentioned, African Americans are nearly four times more likely to develop kidney disease than Caucasians. And what happens, or I guess I should start by saying, is there any way you can prevent it or, or what can you do to maybe change your lifestyle? Sure, there are some things you can do. Of course, uh, with preventing diabetes and high blood pressure and subsequent kidney disease, you want to um, evaluate your diet, have a healthy diet, go to the doctor, get some tests done that we recommend that are very important and they're easy. Get a urinalysis. It's a simple urine test your doctor can take a look at, find out if there's protein in your urine, which is especially important for diabetics. Also, get a blood pressure check regularly, as your doctor recommends, and also to get a blood test that's very simple that can tell you if you uh, have any signs of kidney damage. Right, and because if you do some of the options, you have to go on dialysis, and then That's transplantation right. comes into the mix. So yes, those are, are cha they change your life if you have to go through those options. They so. do. That is a big change, and organ. Unfortunately, all the organs are not available right. that we wish. Um, we have approximately a thousand people on the list right now in South Carolina. Uh, nationally, it's a hundred thousand waiting on a kidney, and only yeah. about seventeen thousand of those will receive a kidney. So, um, we want to do what we can to prevent that ever from happening. So, and kidney disease can be prevented. All right. Thank you both so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, she made history in Columbia City Council two times over. A look at the path Tamika Isaac Devine has blazed over the past decade. She is this week's modern day history maker.
March is Women's History Month. So many women have blazed the trail and continue to do so. In 2002, Tamika Isaac Devine became the first African-American woman and youngest person to serve on Columbia City Council. Here is a look at her journey. Attorney, Columbia City Council member, wife, mother, daughter, friend, Tamika Isaac Devine. As an elected official, uh, people see the public persona and they don't always realize that you are a person. She made the decision to enter politics and won in 2002. I didn't run to, to make history or anything. But she did, the youngest to sit on Columbia City Council and the first African-American woman. I just thought about it and, and prayed on it and decided instead of kind of being one of those people who are always complaining or saying this is what they should be doing and why don't they do this, I decided that the best way to affect change would be to offer myself as a candidate. She's met challenges and championed causes. And I always pray that the Lord give me strength and wisdom to do what's right um, and not always what's popular. Her family helps keep her grounded. When things sometimes are, are tough, um, they're my sounding board and they're always kind of lifting me up and they say, you know, if, if, you know, if God has you, don't worry about anything else. Her busy life is a balancing act. I think the balance just kind of comes with um, recognizing that you can't be everything to everybody all the time. And you always have to make time for what's important. I don't want to ever have looked back and said, you know, yes, I gave myself to the city, but that costs time away from my family. Tamika still has more goals to accomplish. This is my God-given purpose. This is what I'm meant to do. And so, you know, that can take a lot of different forms in the future, but um, I hope to always continue to be advocating for people who don't necessarily know how to or won't always be able to advocate for themselves. We would like to thank all of our guests this morning. Until next time, I'm Megan Norman. This is Awareness.